Greetings and salutations. This is going to be a fun video. What we're going to do is create a super simple bash script using the most primitive tools that we have on our Linux system. And the point of this video is to show you how super silly, stupid easy it is to make bash scripts. If you're just puttering around in the terminal and you're just learning this stuff and you're trying to get your head wrapped around scripting, you may have already looked at a couple of scripts and you go, man, I will never be able to do that. I don't understand it. I don't get it. Well, scripts do not have to be complex. They can actually be super, super simple. And that's where we're going to start today. And then I'm going to take our super simple script and I'm going to jazz it up a little bit. I'm going to show you some tips and tricks. And then I'm going to show you probably the most important skill that you need to know in order to be an efficient script writer and that is the ability to steal code. I'm going to show you how to do that later in the video. But first let's get started by talking just a moment or two about bash so that we understand what we're dealing with here. Bash is the GNU born again shell. The guy who wrote it was named Born. That's why it's got its name. And the idea behind the bash shell is to be SH compatible. That was the original Unix shell, but it needed to be open source. So that's why they rewrote it. And they also added some nifty features in there. The Bash shell's been around for a long time. It predates Linux. GNU was a Unix-like operating system that the Free Software Foundation had been working on in the late 80s. This guy named Linus Torvalds came along and created the Linux kernel and they combined the two to create a working operating system. So that's where we get the name Linux today, but most of it is actually GNU, and some people are a little upset about that, and they like to remind you every now and again that GNU is a big chunk of what we now call Linux. Well, all the political and credit uh, stuff aside, it's very cool and it works very well. The shell is a command language interpreter and what it does is it executes commands that it reads from standard input or from a file. So what does that mean? Well, the kernel is the heart of the operating system on the computer. It's the piece of software that actually tells the computer to do useful things. Humans need a way to communicate with that kernel, and the shell wraps around it, hence the name shell. And when you type a command in the shell, it's something that you can look at and read and you know what it is. That is turned into system calls that the system can uh, interpret and use. That's it. So when you type something into the shell, you're talking directly to the computer. Now that input can come from the keyboard and it can also come from a file. And when it comes from a file, we call that a script. There's also the concept of redirecting input. We're going to look at that uh, as we write our script. And that is that you can take output, let's say, from a program, and you can direct that into a file, or you can send it on to Bash to execute other things. And you can also take um, input from the keyboard and put it directly into a file. And that's what we're going to do today, boys and girls. I'm going to show you how to do that with one of the simplest tools that there is. So let's go ahead and get out of this uh, manual page there. You can go read that if you want to. And uh, the cool thing about Bash is it's pretty much the standard shell on any Linux system that you sit down in front of. It's part of the POSIX standard, which you might have noticed there in that text they were talking about. It's compatible across the board. That's the point. So a script is nothing more than a list of commands at its most basic uh, form. Bash does have a programming language that goes along with it. So you can not only list commands, but you can also get Bash to do useful work that doesn't involve other programs. Bash, therefore, is a complete programming language. Now, there are lots of other languages out there these days. There's Python, there's Rust, there's Ruby, you've heard of Java, you've heard of Perl. Those different languages uh, are pretty much working on the same concept that they use some sort of interpreter and they're not compiled code. 
So when you hear about languages like C++, for instance, the C programming language is native to Linux, that those languages, they don't create something that you can read humanly when they're done. You, you take your code and you feed it to a compiler and then that turns into like a binary code or an assembly language or something like that that is fed directly to the kernel. So that's on an entirely different level. So in order to make a script work, you have to have the interpreter. It doesn't stand on its own like a binary does. Therefore, scripting languages tend to be just a tad slower. So um, if you want to write really fast stuff, then you need to go learn how to write in C and compile or some other language like that. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Let's get back to where we're at. So the uh, command that we're going to use to create our file is cat, which is short for concatenate. It's one of the oldest Unix commands out there, and concatenate simply means to take a whole lot of little things and stick them together into one big thing. So you can, for instance, feed a whole bunch of files to cat, and then it will spit them out on the screen one right after the other without a break. Or you can take those files and you can feed them into another file, take a bunch of little files and make one big file. That's what cat does. Today we're going to tell cat to take the input from the keyboard and put it into a file. This is not a text editor. You cannot edit the text once you type it. The only thing you can do is backspace. So you can't jump from line to line, the arrow keys don't work, none of that stuff. You'll see, I'll show you. So we're going to call our file my script.sh. The .sh is there so we know that it's a script and uh, that's very useful when you're writing scripts and the scripts don't necessarily end up in places on the computer where they're going to be executed like regular commands. So if it's a script that's just going to live in a directory in your home directory, you might want to leave the sh on it. But uh, when we move it to into the system to be used every day, I usually like to cut that off because number one, I don't want to type it, and number two, it's not necessary. But for now, we'll put it there. So what do we get if I hit enter here? Well, we get this. And I can just start typing. And then I hit enter. I can do line two. Right? But if I make a big mistake here, all I can do is uh, use the backspace key. If I try and use the arrow keys, Look, we get strange characters on the screen. So if I happen to make a mistake somewhere up on line one or line two and I notice it later, there's nothing I can do about it. So the only thing that I can do is just exit the program. And I'll use control C to do that. And it just basically tells the system to break the program and dump everything and forget it, right? So let's start over here. And this time we're going to write a real script. The very first thing that needs to be in a script, the very first line is called the shebang. The shebang tells the system what language we have written our script in and where it can find the interpreter. And it consists of a hashtag or pound sign or whatever you want to call that, and a bang, which is an exclamation point, and then the exact location of our uh, interpreter. In this case, bin slash bash. And I have to stop here for just a second and comment on this way of doing things because there's a trend lately in Linux to try and move more of the executable code into one directory. Like, for instance, these days in Debian and Ubuntu, uh, the bin directory doesn't actually exist under root. It's a link to slash usr slash bin. And you could put that as your shebang as long as your script was going to run only on your system. However, uh, there are, and there are other ways to do it as well. Um, you can use an environment command to do that. You might see that in a script. I prefer to do it this old way because this way is going to be around forever because there are so many scripts on your system right now that kick off this way, they will have to maintain compatibility with this traditional shebang till the end of time. Okay? So stick with this one. 
I knew that was going to come up in the comments, so I wanted to say something. Now, the first command that we're going to introduce you to is echo. E-C-H-O. Anything in quotes, it will print. So what do we want our script to do? I mean, you have to have some idea of what you're doing, right? <laughs> well, maybe you're like me, and you're one of those people who don't know what day it is half the time. So we're going to have our script tell us what day it is. And uh, so we want it to tell us what it's doing, right? Today is OK. And then what we're going to have it do is run the cal command, which will print a calendar on the screen. And then just to be, uh, I guess, uh, thorough, we're going to print the date and the current time. And so we're basically using just two commands there. I like to finish a script up by putting in exit. And the exit command, as we're writing it right now, is, is pretty much redundant. We don't need to do this because after the date command runs, it will be finished and it will just dump it back to the shell. But the exit command, what it'll do is just make sure that it goes back to the original environment. Like I said, here it's pretty redundant, but you can make exit do some interesting things, like you can have it set error codes that you can have the computer look up later to figure out whether your script ran properly. And so if you set an error code on that, uh, then you can use that later uh, to generate an error message to let you and users know, hey, there was something wrong here. So we're just going to leave exit in there. I just like to do it. Once we get our um, file the way we like it, then what we do is control D and what that does is uh, writes it out. So let's go ahead and cat that. And you see we have our file there. Is it ready to execute? No! We have to set the permissions next. We have to tell the system that this is an executable file, that this is code that it can use to do useful work. And we're going to do that very simply with the change mode command. But we don't put an E on the end, so it's C-H-M-O-D. And we're going to use the numeric way of setting permissions, in this case 755. And 7 means that you can read, write, and execute. The first number represents the owner of the file, which in this case is going to be me, and I will have complete control over this file. I can read to it, I can write to it, and I can execute it. The next one is any group that I belong to that I might be sharing the file with. Now this is something that you don't see very often on modern Linux systems. It goes back to the days of Unix when you had one big central computer and everybody was working from a terminal and this was a safe way to share files in a group. And then the last permission is the world. That means if somebody comes along and finds the file laying on the street somewhere and they pick it up and look at it, they can read it and they can execute it, but that's it. They can't write to it. They don't have permission to do so. And uh, what we're doing here is uh, using a numeric representation where 1 equals execute, 2 equals write, and 4 equals read. So if, for instance, we wanted to make this file just uh, readable and writable for me, then we would use 6. And if we wanted everybody else just to be able to read it, 4-4. Four, four but we're going to add 755 to make it executable. And then we give it the name of the file. Did it do anything? There's no output. Well, in Linux, if there's no output, that usually means that it worked. So let's check the permissions on that file. So we're going to do ls, and we're going to do the long option, and we'll do the name of the file, my script. And as you can see, the permissions are right here. And it's saying the first group here is me, read, write, and execute. That's right here. I get my cursor to do what I want it to do. That's me right here, read, write, and execute. And then there's the group here. And then there is the world right there. So if we had a, a file 
as we originally created it. Uh, let's just uh, look at another file here that we're going to use in a minute called snarf. <laughs> I know. Don't worry, it'll make sense later. Uh, let's do that ls command again and let's see where it is this because this is just a text file that I created earlier and you see now that we just have read and write for the owner and the group and read for the world so that's how they come out before we reset the permissions there's another way to reset the permissions and I'll show you how to do it we're going to go to our file manager we're going to go in here we're going to find our file once again and we're going to go to my script we want to display it no, that's not what I want to do. No, 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 no. I want to right click and do properties. Not load it up in the text editor. And we go over here to permissions. And you see that all we have to do is check this box. Allow executing file as program. So if you don't want to fool around with change mod that's how you could do it but I wanted to show you how to do that in a terminal clear the screen so now can we execute it can we run the script can we make sure it works well yes we can so let's go ahead and just type in my script dot sh and see what happens well I misspelled it was that why it didn't run still not found well we know it's there Come on, it's in here. It's in this directory. I know it's here. <laughs> the reason why it's not running is because the system doesn't know where to look for it. By default, Unix and Linux systems don't run every executable file in every directory just because you type it in. There are certain places where executable code goes on your computer. And there's a whole bunch of them, as a matter of fact. And you can find out where all of those places are by showing the path variable. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to use our echo command and then to do that you just use a dollar sign and then path. And it shows that we have a lot of places where programs can exist on our machine starting out with something called home slash joe slash bin which is my private bin directory. And then we just go through a whole bunch of stuff here. Here's use a lo local SBIN, which is uh, for secure binary packages. Uh, USR local bin. That's normal, that's normal packages that we would uh, generate ourselves that we want to share with the entire uh, user base on that machine and a whole bunch of other stuff. So where should I put this script if I want it to be executable all the time? Well, we want to put that script probably locally for us. So in order to do that, if you're going to be creating a bunch of scripts, you probably want to create your very own local bin directory. And it's super simple. All you have to do, and if I list my home directory here, is um, eh, typing and talking. If you see here, I have this directory in here called bin. On Ubuntu and anything that is um, related to Ubuntu, if you just put bin in there and then restart the system or log in and log out, it should find it and automatically put this location for finding executable code into your own uh, path. It, it does it automatically at boot up. Sometimes it doesn't work, especially on some Debian-based systems. I've had people come back and tell me, hey, this isn't working for me. And sometimes it can be a problem with other systems. So at the end of the video, I will show you how to fix that problem. But for right now, it should work just fine. But if we're just testing our script, we don't even need to do that. We don't need to do all that garbage right now. All we need to do is tell the system where it is. And the shortcut for the system to know that you want to execute a file which is local to you in your present working directory is a, a dot and a slash. And then we put in the name of the file. It even auto finds it. So let's see if it runs. Yay, our script worked. It tells us what day it is.
it's doing exactly what we want it to do. And we wrote it in nothing, right? I mean, we did it with cat. We could even add a line to our script using cat. You want to do that? Because have you ever noticed that uh, one of the things that you see a lot when fixing problems is that you need to add a line to the end of a configuration file somewhere? Well, all you're doing is adding a line to a script. So let's use cat to do that just for fun. Let's, let's add another line to our script. Well, actually, we can't. We put the exit in there, didn't we? Well, I guess it's time we have to move on to a better editor. Let me introduce you to Nano. Nano comes installed by default on a lot of systems. And yes, there are other editors out there like VI, but uh, we're going to look at Nano today. It's my favorite. It's the one I use. If you would like to go through all the pain and anguish of learning how to use VI, be my guest, but Nano is a lot easier. So let's open up our script. Right. And you see here that we have exit on the end. We're going to just uh, go down one line here. We're going to add another line just for fun. Um, what should we put? Let's echo. And we're going to do a space. And um, yeah, make it real annoying like that. <laughs> With nano to save a file, it's control O, like so, write it out, done. And to quit, it's going to be control X. Now, let's run our script again. Well, that worked. The only problem is with our little script is uh, you notice that it is... Uh, kind of running at the bottom of the screen and uh, it gets a little confusing to look at the output here. How about if we just add one more line here? Like let's go in here and uh, right after we do the shebang we can put in a clear command which means that when our script runs it will uh, clear the screen. So let's get out of that. Control X to exit and once again we're going to run that oh wait a minute hold on control x we know we want to run the script not open it here we go worked now you're getting the idea we just start poking at these things we can keep editing them and they can become gargantuan after a certain amount of time all right um, the next thing that we want to do is steal some code to add more functionality to our script. And I have already uh, stolen the code and stuck it in a text file, which you have already been introduced to. That file is called snarf. How do we get it into our script? Well, let me show you how to do that with nano because it's super easy. See, you don't have to understand <laughs> what the code, uh, how the code works necessarily. All you need to know is, is what the code does. Okay, so you can go around the internet and you can steal snatches of code to do strange things. In this case, we're going to have the script search for a flag file. What is a flag file? Well, this is sort of an advanced concept. Programs running on Linux and scripts sometimes can create files that are called flag files and essentially if the file exists it means that some operation is possible uh, you something's been done the flag file can be referenced by other scripts or the script itself to make sure that an operation ran right and so we're going to take that concept and we're going to just do something ridiculous with it and so i've taken my little exit here and i'm moving that down and i'm going to create another line here okay and now I'm going to use control shift R in nano to grab another file and the file we're going to grab is that snarf text file we've got all right it found it and I'm just going to insert all of the text from this file in here now of course you can have a browser open you can copy and paste it's you can do all this stuff, but 
we're going to do it this way. Okay, so it, it put a whole bunch of text on the screen. All right, where did it go? Well, right after the date here, we now have what are called comments. See how it uh, is telling us what it's doing? A comment starts out with one of those pound sign hashtags. And one of the things that you should do with your scripts once you get them running is to go through and put comments in here. So I wrote this little chunk of code to do uh, this kind of useless operation <laughs> a while back, okay, and put it in this text file. So to remember what it does, you have to put some documentation in there. And you may think to yourself, well, if I'm writing just a super simple script that's just being used by me, why should I bother with documenting what I'm doing? Because six months later, when you have to edit something and you go back and look at that script, it's going to be very useful to you. So we have our stolen code plus our little uh, comments in here. And just to make it look a little better, I'm going to put a little space there. And come down here and start separating things out so that they're not so squished together. Let's see what this does. And then we'll come back and take a look at the code and I'll tell you what it's doing. So um, let's go ahead and uh, control O, write out. And we have written our script. So exit. Now let's run it again. So this time, it tells us what day it is and what time it is, but now it's asking us to create a snarf file. <laughs> it's a flag file of some sort. For some reason or another, you need a snarf file in this directory, right? Um, so, sure. Why not? Let's create it. Hit the Y key, lowercase y, and it's done. And it says, have a nice day. So if I run it again, it finds the snarf file and it tells me that it's in my home directory. There's some pretty fancy stuff going on there. How did it know it was me? Well, let's talk a little bit before we start analyzing the code about something called variables. I showed you a variable earlier and that was your path variable. A variable is nothing more than a little piece of code or a, a line of text, or a name. Uh, it could be anything that you want to store in memory, and you want to be able to retrieve it later. So we can create a variable super easy, like var equals, and uh, we're just going to put it in quotes here. This is some text I want to put in memory right there that's all we got to do now if I clear the screen and I use the echo command again and I use a dollar sign and we look at var which is what we created you'll see there it is so I can do the same thing once again with your path okay there's another variable called user That's me, right? Where are these other variables coming from? Well, when your computer boots up and bash uh, initializes, it creates a bunch of these variables. And they're very useful. Uh, they're used by the system, and they're also used by you if you want to incorporate them into scripts. So let's uh, look at a list of those, and you can use the environment command, ENV and it'll just list them all for you. These are not in any particular order, and a lot of these things just look like gobbledygook, but if we look a little closer, we, we can find some useful information in here. Um, like, here's my shell. What is my shell? My shell is bin bash. That's what I'm running in right now. And let's see, what else do we have here that's useful? Present working directory is work in uh, home, and uh, the Log name is Joe, so anything I do will be logged as a username Joe. And then here is my uh, language, which is English US. 
Here's my home directory, home joke. You get the idea. There are all of these things that are loaded into the system. And uh, so our little extra bit of code that we put in there to create our snarf file uses variables. Let's see how it does it. So I'm just going to go up here and I'm going to nano my script and we're going to go through this line by line. So we have our clear command and today is and all that stuff and these are our simple commands. The first thing that we have going on is known as an if statement. And an if statement, and that's exactly what this is, it's just one big long nested if statement. An if statement is um, a way to get the computer to test for something and then do something depending on what it finds. So the syntax is very simple. It starts out with if and then we put our test in brackets and our test here which is right here is basically saying please look for a file called snarf in the user's home directory that's executing this and if it is not there that's what the exclamation point does. It turns the logic upside down. I tend to write more negative logic than positive logic. So if I didn't put that exclamation point there and it was just the dash F, which means look for a file, then it would, uh, it would do something if the file exists. In this case, I'm having it do something if the file does not exist. And what I'm having it do is echo on the screen See, this is a little script within our script here. Uh, this little thing that says there's no snarf file. Would you like to create one? And then I'm telling you what the input is. So when you have a capital N and a lowercase y, that means that the no is the default. So you could hit enter or any other key on the keyboard be besides y, and it would skip that step. But if you do press y, it's going to be read by the read command and then it's going to be put in a variable we talked about that called choice right so now we're going to use the if command again to read choice and figure out what it is so we say if the variable choice which is in quotations here equals and it's not just one equals it's two because we're telling it yes it equals and no we're not looking if it's not there it has to be this if it equals y then we want the system to go ahead and create this snarf file and put it in the user's home directory. And that's what it does right there with the touch command. And then when it's done, it just exit out, exits out. Now, that's a nested if. It's an if within an if. So here's how it runs. If it does not find a snarf file, it puts this on the screen it pauses and waits for input. That's what the read command does. The, uh, what it's looking for is Y, and Y is the only acceptable command. And then it reads that variable, and if I say Y, it creates the file. If I hit enter or anything else, or type n an N, for instance, it's just going to say no, and it's going to go on, and it's going to go down to have a nice day. However, if that file does exist, then this is going to figure it out. So it has the file. It's not going to do this. It's going to go to else. And then the else command is going to say echo found the snarf file in, in the uh, user's home directory. Here's my name. Remember I was showing you that variable? Well, there it is right there. So I'm just having the script go read that variable and then print it. That's all I'm doing, and that's how it knows my name. And then the phi at the bottom here tells it that this if statement is done, and it dumps us back, and then it echoes have a nice day. And that is how that works. But, like I said, even if you didn't understand what I just told you, if you don't know what any of this means... <laughs> You can still copy and paste it and put it in your script and it will do this uh, function as long as you have all the syntax correct. Okay? So that is very cool indeed. We have created, using very simple tools, a very powerful script to do completely useless stuff, but you get the idea, right? 
So before we um, close this off, what I want to do is show you how to put it where it's useful for you. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is probably uh, we want to put some notation in here. We want to put some documentation. So what does this script do? Um, this is a script to show you how to script. That's all it is. You want to put up there what you're doing, you know. Okay, and then you can come down here and you can get really pedantic about this. And the more pedantic you are, the better off it is. So we want to clear the screen. Okay, we got that there. Um, let's go down here. Uh, that well, we we really don't need to. Well, I mean, let's do it. Let's let's do it the way it's supposed to be done here. Let us notate every line that we do. Why not? You've hung around this long. You can you can wait for this stuff, right? For me to type slowly and try and figure out what I'm doing. Um, tell user what today is. Why not, right? Um, we can keep going with this. not what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, why not? Let's go ahead and just put, uh, we'll just finish the job, you know? So now our script is very well notated. We know exactly what it's doing. And um, by the way, if there are any misspellings in here, feel free to point at the screen and laugh at me. Uh, let's go ahead and we can notate this too. Okay. <laughs> it's all there. So now that we have our notes in place, and we're ready to uh, make our script a part of our system. How are we going to do that? Well, let's go ahead and get out of Nano here. And we'll clear the screen once again. If we created a directory called Ben, uh, and we put that in our home directory, and that's working for us, then all we would have to do would do, you know, copy it, move it over. Or we could move, use the copy or the move command, MV, copy, either one will do the same thing. We're just going to copy it, and then we could place this into uh, our uh, bin directory. It's super simple. So we take our my script here, and then uh, we probably want to rename this just my script. Uh, we have to tell it where we want to put it, don't we? So in this case, uh, we would want to put it in our home directory bin, All right? And then we could call it anything we wanted to at this point. Call it my script. Well, I'm not going to actually do that because what I want to show you is I want to show you how to put it in where um, everybody can use it. In other words, we're going to take our script and we're going to make it available to everyone on the system. So we would use the exact same verbiage here, but it would be um, usr slash local slash 
bend like so and make sure that we have the L there because so, I'm actually going to do this and we have to do this with super user privileges so we use sudo yes I know that's technically sudo substitute user do or super user do but I've said it sudo for years people get on me in comments about that okay so that should work so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and throw this in the system like this now it should just find it immediately should be ready to go so if yep it found it so I used the uh, autofill which is the tab key and we know it's gonna work that's it so now it's available not only to me but everybody on the system now let's talk a little bit about if you create a local bin directory and it doesn't work for you um, put this on the last video that I did as well because I've had some people come back and say well I don't understand this isn't working I created this directory I rebooted it and now it doesn't work and that's because you need a little bit of code in the right place to be able to fire that off so let's go to um, the home directory here clear the screen thank you so what we're gonna do is um, I'm going to use nano again we're gonna open up a couple of files with it the first one is dot profile okay and the next one is dot bash RC and we're gonna open up these two files somewhere in here should be the little piece of code that tells the system to add your local bin to the path statement and uh, by the way in nano to switch between two files it's real super easy it's control and the period and uh, the comma keys that have the arrows above them so I can switch back and forth and it's not doing it of course it's alternate sorry it's not control <laughs> there we go uh, well we're not actually gonna write anything here so it doesn't matter that I just screwed that up not really alright so somewhere in here we should be able to find that so we are in the profile direct uh, um, file here and this is the first thing that is loaded when you log into bash so you see the first thing it's looking for is your bash version and then it looks for a file called bash rc right here it's an if statement once again this is a positive if see if it finds the file then it loads bash rc it actually uh, sources the file that's the command right there to get the system to read a file it's just a period which is a shortcut to the source command and then down here you'll see that we have this little piece of code and what it does is it looks for that uh, home bin directory we created if it finds it it exports it to the path see that right there it adds it to the directory or rather it adds the directory to the variable Jeez, okay sorry not trying to confuse anybody there's also another option here it's dot local um, dot bin so you can have like uh, your bin directory be kind of hidden if you want it to if you don't like having it out amongst all of your other files um, you can use that option if you want to I don't I like having my little home bin directory that's it so sometimes for some reason or another um, on some distributions either this does not exist here or what will happen is is that uh, the bash RC file will get hung up and it won't go on and load these next two uh, variables here it won't do it and in that case there's a couple of things that you could do uh, the first one would be to simply take this right here okay and um, copy it over and put it in your bash RC file so let's just do that for fun let's go over here I'm gonna copy this because we really have to uh, we have to run bash RC first right 
it's there anyway. So we can go ahead and just stick that in there using the alternate arrow keys to go over to bash RC and then go all the way down to the end with your arrow keys, right? And then we can just paste that in there like so. And that way it'll make sure that it gets loaded. It really doesn't matter if you do this twice. It's not that big a deal. So some people would be like, well, wait a minute. What if it starts working in profile? <laughs> it really doesn't matter because it's just doing the same thing twice. No big deal whatsoever. And this way, it'll make sure that it works. I hope you found this video to be interesting. I hope that you got enough out of it to actually be able to start doing some scripting yourself. You are more than welcome, by the way, to go ahead and start out with a real text editor like gedit uh, or uh, Kate, or uh, in this case, I'm running Linux Mint, so my text editor is xed, and I have my xed set up exactly the way I like it, you know? So, uh, why didn't it run? Because you didn't click it. Oh, well, let's go ahead and get the text editor then. There. So yeah, you can use a really nice text editor like this <laughs> to create your script and you can do it, you know, using all the right clicks, cut and paste and all that other stuff. You don't need to uh, be using the cat command, but it's actually very cool. I didn't show you uh, how to add a line with cat. Just realize that. How about we do that? So let me go ahead and get out of here. No, I don't want to save this. No, I don't want to save that. Uh, just for fun, as a bonus on the end here, I'll show you how to do this. So if we want to add a line to a script, and um, in this case, we're going to do our snarf file. So let's uh, go to work. Nah. Capital Capitalization got me. Okay. And we go to work here where our little snarf file now exists. Actually, my script is still here, isn't it? We can do that. Now let's do snarf. Remember, we have an exit at the end of our script. We can't just conveniently add a line. It won't work. That's why we had to move to nano in the first place, right? Don't make those kinds of stupid mistakes, kids. So here we go. Um, if I want to add a line, I can cat, redirect, and then use that arrow twice. This tells the system not to replace the original file or create a new file. This tells it that you want to put a line at the end of a file. All right. So let's go ahead and just cat and look at the snarf thing. All the text. All right. There it is right there. So we can now use our cat command again. Oh, what am I doing? Okay, there's our file. We open that up and we're just going to put in, we added this text. <laughs> and uh, hit enter, control D to tell it we're done. And now if we go back and cat that again, you'll see that we added that line right down here at the bottom. So I just wanted to be able to show you that. Thank you, boys and girls. It's always fun to do these things. I enjoy them immensely. I look forward to your comments and suggestions. Thank you for watching. And we're going to do this again soon. I hope to be doing more Linux-related videos. And I really want to do things that are distribution agnostic and simple, easy little things like this that you can use no matter what your Linux world is like. If you have any suggestions, put them in the comments below. Your comments and suggestions are always welcome. Until we do it again, see ya.